morning, everyone. So this presentation is on uh, using zone block devices in Fedora. Um, I'm Brian Gurney, a senior software engineer at Red Hat, uh, working on file systems and storage. So for this talk, I first want to give a special thanks to uh, Damien Lamal at Western Digital, uh, who helped me a lot for zone block devices and also helped me get my test system out of a bricked state after some chaos happened, but he helped me with, with uh, the first parts of getting uh, zone block devices working. There's a very informative website, zonestorage.io, that uh, he maintains to help explain what zone block devices are. So if you have any questions uh, beyond this, you can take a look at zonestorage.io to look at what zone block devices are uh, and where the, the Linux kernel support is now. Damien's primarily maintaining the zoned part of the block layer. Uh, so first, what is a block storage device? Um, a block storage device is a device that can read and write data in blocks of a given size typically 512 bytes or some multiple of 512 bytes, preferably in a power of two, uh, four kilobytes, and so on. And some examples of block devices are the hard disk drive, which records magnetically on a platter with a mechanical arm, a solid state drive, which would be some sort of form of flash memory, either based on NAND flash or 3D cross point or some other solid state medium that does not involve mechanical moving. Um, and also a tape drive, which is a reel of magnetic tape uh, run pass ahead. Obviously you can only access sequentially on tape drives, but sequentially or randomly on hard disk drives and solid state drives. So. Zone block devices operate within zones of the device, which define whether sequential writes may occur. Um, usually for a zone block device, they'll have a, a good portion, about 99% of sequential write only zones for uh, the medium. The conventional zones work just like regular block devices. Sequential write required zones have a write pointer which indicates the next writable uh, sector in a zone. So I have a diagram with three example zones and the right pointers at the current location. Um, and then the drive actually has firmware which reports the current condition of the right pointer in each zone. And I have a diagram here. This specific example has 256 megabyte zones. So the right pointer in the first zone in this example is full, uh, it's at the end. So in order to write this, you would have to reset the write pointer to the beginning and then write in that zone again. Um, and then the other example, that's a partially uh, open zone uh, and then there's a, an empty zone. In the text, this is actually a command called block zone uh, report, BLK zone. And it reports the first two zones here are full. The second one is open implicit and then the next two are empty. So you could start a right at the right pointer of the open implicit zone. Uh, so the types of zone block devices right now, um, the older type are called device managed zone block devices. The firmware controls the zone management, but it exposes to the host a standard block device interface. The advantage here is that you can use existing file systems with these devices the disadvantage is that these existing file systems will end up seeing slow performance because the device abstracts away the management of the zones. Um, and so you start to see performance degrade as the drive has to shuffle between conventional and the sequential write-only zones. And the newer drives are host-managed zone block devices. And the firmware presents a zone block device interface, so it'll tell with the right commands, it'll tell the driver what the zones are, where the right pointers are. And so that's an extension to the SCSI interface. Um, the advantage here is that the host can have direct control of I.O. and zone management. Um, the disadvantage here is that almost none of the drivers right now in Linux understand how to do this. Um, 
And that's more than just the file systems. It's also the I.O. schedulers. Schedulers reorder I.O. for optimal performance. However, if they reorder writes, this may result in errors. So there's been, um, as it says here, it's I.O. schedulers, file systems, and volume managers need to know how to handle the write pointers, where they can write, when they can write, when they need to reset. And so the main type of zone block device that exists now are what are called shingled magnetic recording hard disk drives. And so these SMR hard disk drives record data in an overlapping fashion. The diagram on the left, which these diagrams are from Zone Storage IIO, um, the diagram on the left is a conventional hard disk drive track map um, where you can see the tracks are individually laid, but they have a lot of space in between them, which is used for error correction, head location, and so on. Whereas SMR hard disk drives have a head with a narrow read head and a wide write head. So they can achieve higher track density, be able to read all of the magnetic fields in the tracks, even if they're partially overlapped. However, to write in those tracks, they, in those zones, they need to rewrite the entire zone. So. These ideal applications, the best ideal applications for these drives are applications that do not need to write in the middle of data commonly. Um, and so that's very conducive for large object storage in archival style applications, which have frequent writes in a sequential fashion, frequent batches of long sequential writes, not that many parallel writes, infrequent reads, which will usually be in a sequential fashion. Your classic backup every single day and then restore once every, hopefully never, but in say two, every two or four months or so. I can hear those backup veterans laughing. You've had to do a restore. Um, and ideally there would be many drives distributed across many nodes, achieving capacity, throughput, and redundancy. So you don't really mind that a hard disk drive will have a maximum throughput of say 180 megabytes per second sequentially. That's perfectly fine in your application. Then this would work very well. And so the large average size is, is a key for many applications. Um, I previously worked in a backup application that had an, a large average size of 90 megabytes per file. So a 256 megabyte zone is perfectly normal. And then long-term retention would be more important than short-term performance. So what doesn't work with zone block devices? And the applications that are less conducive for this are file systems, drivers, and schedulers that don't know the limits of sequential write restrictions. And then partition tables. Uh, some partition tables, particularly GPT, will have data that ends up in sequential only zones um, at the end of the drive. Classically, uh, SMR hard drives have sequential and random data areas at the beginning for the first 1%, and then the last 99% is sequential write required zones. Um, RAID, uh, the current MD RAID uh, implementation does not understand the, uh, the zones, and your average RAID chunk size is usually um, 64 kilobytes to one or two megabytes or so, which does not fit into a 256 megabyte zone. Right now, you can potentially try to create a RAID volume, a uh, RAID array with these drives. Please don't. In the future, it'll be the driver to prevent it right now, because if you were to try a very large uh, chunk size in RAID, it will take over one second to write that chunk. That may be a latency that's too high currently for the current strategy. Uh, for, and lastly, booting off of a zone block device, even if it was possible, would it really be practical considering that an OS drive has usually a very large number of very small files that it may have to read and write randomly? That's not really a practical use for zone block devices, which usually you'll have a small OS drive, which will be a small flash drive. And then the storage volumes will be non-system drives. It'll be very large and replaceable, easily replaceable. 
So how can you use zone block devices in Linux right now with, say, the 5.3 kernel, the 5.4 kernel, and so on? Um, so the kernels, the optimal time for zone block devices has been, right, right now, for the 4.17, 4.18 kernel is when the scheduler changes were in so that the, uh, the scheduler was able to use it. And that set up everything else to be able to use. So you can use, you should use MQ deadline for the scheduler. That's the only schedule right now that understands the right restrictions for the zones. One of my first issues was when Damien, he asked me, are you using the deadline scheduler? And I asked, well, I said, no. Why does that matter? And then I found out, because that's the only schedule that understands the limitations. So to create a file system, you can use F2FS, the flash-friendly file system, with the dash M option, which uses the uh, zones for, it understands host-managed zone block devices. The M is for host-managed. Uh, how, however, the maximum size for that file system would be 16 terabytes. Um, right now, the, um, some of the drives that you, single bank of recording drives you can find are 14 terabytes, but the, there have been 20 terabyte drives announced, and that would be too big for one file system right now with F2FS. Um, and you can create an LVM logical volume to make smaller zoned block devices so you can achieve partitioning. However, you have to use the PV create with data alignment switch to set it to the zone size. Um, and so th that way, instead of the uh, LVM header offsetting the first usable uh, extent, it'll make sure that the first extent is at the beginning of the zone. So then you won't have unaligned rights. Uh, and that will present a host managed zone block device, which you will then have to use with F2FS. With the DM zone device mapper target, you can actually use conventional file systems, um, which is very nice. And coming soon, ZoneFS, which will expose every zone in a file where you can directly write to the file, you can truncate the file to reset the right pointer, and so on. And the basic rules of the road for zone block devices, reads are performed in the same way as a normal block device. You can read sequentially or randomly. You should do it less often to keep the, uh, the queue depth low so that other I.O. can proceed on the drive. And the driver must keep track of the zones and the right pointers in order to know where to write. And if you don't write in the, the correct location at the right pointer, then you'll see nasty errors like that. Illegal request unaligned write command. You may see hundreds or thousands of those if you use a conventional file system with these drives. And it'll be at first hard to debug. You may, in my case, I ended up seeing thousands, hundreds of thousands of those errors the first time until I switched the scheduler because the scheduler was doing the wrong thing. So the file system and the scheduler need to know how to use the, uh, the right pointer. So in this example, I have a uh, partial zone write where the driver will run the equivalent of block zone report on the drive and then find out where the right pointer is for a specific zone. And then it'll perform a write of data smaller than the zone size. I'm using DD as this example um, at some odd size in this case, which ends up the right pointer it now says 0x2468. <coughs> Obvious number, we can see what it is. Uh, and so say the application wanted to reuse that zone. It needs to reset the right pointer and that is with an explicit block zone reset command. That maps to a SCSI um, command and also an ATA command that says reset the right pointer for this zone. And the, re the report zones command, you can do that for one specific zone or the entire drive. And the command for the drive takes a little time. Um, it's not too bad, but it's a good thing to do at first when creating a new file system. The driver will do this to uh, find out what to do. So in summary, uh, the Linux kernel support for zone block devices continues to evolve. It's in a state where you can use it at the very least with F2FS. However, there's not really a solution right now for same host device redundancy. ND RAID doesn't really know how to use these drives yet. Um, and 
with these very large drives with a throughput for the SMR hard drives, the throughput's going to be lower. You may not want to do an entire disk build because 14 terabytes or so may take a day or two or longer to, to rebuild a single drive. So then that calls into question, could there be something better suited than classical RAID for this? And elsewhere in the Linux kernel, there's been future support via other file systems announced. Uh, ButterFS and Bcache are announcing host managed zone support. Uh, and there's other ideas for alternate APIs. ZoneFS, where the user won't have to uh, understand how to use, they won't have to code their own driver for a file system. They'll say, I'd like to do direct writes to individual files. And ZoneFS will provide that interface to do that. So any questions? Yes? Are there still any major price differences, uh, which is the whole background for the price? Of, yes. Archive storage capacity versus, you know, classical HDD type storage capacity? Um, price per gigabyte ratio? I noticed it was down to like 7% in certain you know, comparisons. Yeah. Uh, 7% or 70? I didn't hear that. 7. So what, what is the price difference between zoned and classical hard drives? Um, it's not that much difference. Um, there is a uh, little bit of uh, capacity um, increase. Um, but when you get multiple drives, that scale amplifies with hundreds or thousands of drives in a cluster. Um, and I, I forget the, I think a 14 terabyte drive was about $500. I'm overestimating intentionally because I don't remember the exact price. Um, and so the, the price per terabyte is about seven, eight, nine times less than what it would be for flash. Um, and there's, there's uh, ideas in the industry for flash zone drives, uh, which will actually present a more direct interface than the flash translation layer uh, in a drive, which may be interesting for high capacity drives, tighter control on wear leveling, uh, and so on. Yes? How long? Yes. And the second, have you posted RFPs for announcements of tools like LDM to handle the PDGA smartly without the use of inconvenience? So um, it should work basically. So yeah. If the, it's not, then you should probably work. Okay. The last question first Is there an RFE posted for uh, LVM for a better uh, handling of zone block device, uh, zoned uh, partition creation? Not yet. I think I may, because remembering to offset it by the zone size is a little complex to do, so it might be nice to have a front end to have LVM query, what is the zone size, okay, I'll place the first extent right at the beginning of the next zone to make it easier. Um, and then the other question is, what is the data endurance and lifetime on these drives? Um, I'm not speaking for the manufacturers, but I believe it's about the same as the endurance for um, magnetic, uh, regular magnetic hard drives. Um, they're able to get le more data space, more track space used, um, less control tracks in between by having these overlapping tracks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we it's the the hard part about endurance is that you have you usually have to wait that long to find out how long the drives will last. Accelerated testing may not produce the same results as actually experience. Um, so the, the, some people are seeing higher failure rates with hard disk drives than they are with flash. And then there are some that may see different results. Um. Just to add, add, 
I read that there are some host aware drives, and these drives will automatically allocate, automatically manage the zone, but they also expose the interface. Is it true? Uh, the, the, that's a difference. Are there drives um, right now? There are host drive, host managed drives. The host managed drives yeah, provide the interface. Host managed drives not write sequentially, but they uh, supposed to do host aware drives. Host aware, yes. Host aware drives are able to present the zone interface, but could also do the same thing as the drive managed. Yeah. So you can switch between either interface. And are there any such drives? Are there any SMR drives in general, or? Well, I think that there is that the that Seagate Archive drives and it is drive managed. Yes. yes. Yeah, they're, they're admittedly they're kind of it's a little difficult to find some of these SMR drives on the market because they usually sell to large OEMs selling thousands of drives or hundreds of drives for a specific application. And it's not going to be as visible on the consumer market for an individual drive uh, SKU if you're purchasing one drive. You have to look for a specific part number. Um, yes? Just uh, for information, um, I took a bunch of these CBA 8 terabyte archive drive managed ones. Drive managed. Put them into a fiber and run them not as well performing as we briefly elaborated on, but they survived it. Yes. Yeah. Just for the Heinz was mentioning that he has uh, drive managed uh, SMR drives in a uh, in a filer, and they've been running for a while. Um, so it, with that, it, that's the key, though, that the the application is very conducive to those sequential writes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, this camera, that's just me being stupid because uh, they are not meant mm. that kind of deployment. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, in the landscape, what's the status of older operating system in terms of uh, uh, system managed disks? Other operating systems? Um, so I know Windows supports these with ReFS, the resilient file system. Um, I don't know the exact restrictions on that. Um, admittedly, I have, I've been working in Linux for a while, so. Um, but I used to work in Windows uh, as a system administrator in a large storage. So um, now, in, in, the, in the rest of the industry, I know that Dropbox is using these drives, but they wrote their own software and their own drivers, closed source, unfortunately, so we don't get to see the work, so. This sort of this sort of spoke to me in terms of like a closed source software company wrote the software to use these drives, but now the drives exist. Us in the open source environment have to figure out how to use them because they do exist. So it's sort of like the classical 1990s when there was hardware and they, the vendors did not provide the drivers. So then now we have to figure out. However, in this case, there are West. Damien at Western Digital and I believe uh, there's a few other contributors at Seagate are providing Linux kernel patches to use the drives. We're just at the point where now the file systems and the other applications have to get drivers working with these drives. And so it takes a little while. Yeah. Uh, has maybe companies, uh, other companies like Dropbox, uh, I need to think about the fact that it's uh, shown interest in contributing to it since they are quite open in their uh, so the question was, have any of the other um, application, large storage application companies, uh, like a Dropbox or Backblaze style company, shown interest in providing? Not that I've seen so much um, in the Linux F file system development. Um, the, the, the ButterFS uh, is one that, that is a... Uh, one, I don't, uh, Facebook has been contributing a little bit to, to the ButterFS side because they're also working on uh, ButterFS anyway. Um, but I haven't seen any f from the application developers uh, in terms of that. Last question, maybe? Mm. <coughs> All right, thank you. <laughs>